are in Baird country. Okay, hello everybody. Today we have an awesome guest. This is Hap Wilson. He's an author of 15 books. He is a canoe tripping woodsman, outdoor savant in general, owner of Cabin Falls Eco Lodge, owner of Eco Trail Builders, excellent uh, presenter at all kinds of outdoor events and a long time uh, icon of conservation in the outdoors. Hap, welcome. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks, Jim. Real pleasure to uh, sit here and chat with you. Thanks. You're very, very welcome. So I'm going to go back a few years and uh, uh, to a story of actually the first time that I met you in the flesh. I don't think it could be a more cool way to meet Hap Wilson, <laughs> but you're sitting in your cabin um, on the Lady Evelyn River. It's late in the evening, and uh, it's a it's a nice night out, and you hear some sort of sound, or what exactly happened? Uh, well, it's a, actually a long story because we had uh, paddled out with the, with the kids, uh, and the kids were fairly young at the time, and, and Andrea and I were on our way back to Tomogamy. We were paddling out, with, and we got which, uh, totally drenched. And we were, we were camped near Frank Falls. And we decided, well, let's, you know what, let's go back to the cabin. We'll dry out and we'll, we'll, we'll go the next day. So we, uh, we actually hiked back because we have a, we have a, a trail from, from center. And uh, we got back to the cabin and uh, dried out and just relaxing. And all of a sudden we heard a lot of shouting and banging and, and, <laughs> and noise across the river. That's where the portage is. Uh-huh. So I thought, wow, oh, these guys... They must be troublemakers, you know. So I, uh, <clears throat> I went to the, and it was pitch black. There was, you know, I went over. Um, I know paddling over. I, I grabbed one of our old canoes, and it had a kind of a shaky seat. And I remember, kind of uh, sneaking over, and the seat actually broke, mm-hmm. just below the portage, below the campsite, and it made a bang. Mm-hmm. And then that caused a flurry of excitement. I think up at the campsite because I heard a lot more <laughs> shouting and screaming. And I thought, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna continue this. So I uh, um, I got out of the canoe, pulled up quietly, and I snuck up through the bush um, on my belly, about a good hundred meters up the slope, over logs, under round rocks. I got within oh, it must be twenty feet of the fire, and I saw the the, the, the there were two strange things. Mm-hmm. One was the dog laying there mm-hmm. who didn't sniff me out. It didn't mm-hmm. know I was there. Who was supposed to be a herding dog as well. I know. and <laughs> But I'm you, pretty good. I had a lot of practice doing this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, the younger, when I was younger. Anyway, I, I took a while looking at this guy, a pretty big guy standing beside the fire, sharpening this stick. Mm-hmm. to a very sharp point, and I'm thinking, man, if I jump out on these guys and scare the bejeebers <laughs> out of them, I'm going to have that thing stuck through my heart. So I, I, you know, I contemplate, am I gonna, what am I going to do? You know, so I think I made it. I didn't really jump out to try this guy. I just kind of nonchalantly walked into the, uh, the, I guess, the campfire. I think you made a bear noise, actually. Yeah, I could have done, <laughs> I could have done that. That's, that's, that's probably true. So... Uh, but no, we sat there and, he, and we shared a drink and a couple of stories, and um, that's when I, I first met the, the famous. Uh, your brother was there, or no? We, yep, my yeah, brother Ted, the, my cousin yeah. Brad, and our buddy Will. Yep, the Baird family yeah. uh, the trio and the and the dog, and uh, and then uh, <laughs> I guess the rest is history. Mm-hmm, that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, well, I don't think I was uh, had really done a whole lot in the way of. Uh, I guess I had started doing some uh, producing some outdoor content and getting some uh, getting some stuff out there at that time, but I hadn't uh, I hadn't really been around in the same kind of way as I guess I am now with uh, with all I've done up until this point. But yeah, I think at that time, yeah. I think you had this kind of resident fear of of bears. So I think right. you had a couple of inc- incidents upriver, yeah. and especially when my seat collapsed and made a bang. I think mm-hmm. I think you were. You know, you were thinking, it's got to be a bear down below the portage. So mm-hmm. you're busy sharpening that spear. Yeah, I, uh, I, well, so this is, so basically before we went off, the backstory is we were being warned a lot about bears. It's a bad, <laughs> the berry crop has failed this year. 
It's been a bad, you know, bad bear year, you know, watch out for bears. So, you know, Francis told us that to uh, Francis, the guy that gave us our shuttle from uh, the, the smooth water and, uh, and at least one other person to two other people <laughs> had warned us that, you know, the berry crop had failed. Uh, and we, so we also <laughs> were maybe just being kind of wusses, but we also saw a big black bear just before that, not too far up river that didn't seem as scared of us as we would have liked it to have been. And also it was a really low water year too. So mm. I remember that we, we didn't have that comfort of deep water between us and a bear that didn't seem scared enough. And then when we got to camp, we we're cooking speckled trout and steak over the fire and we we're by a waterfall, which, which from my uh, um, experience, usually seems to throw off the animals like bears. And even one time I had a wolf just, they don't, they can't make out the sounds of the human, um, you know, maybe the, oh, oh, like, I don't know what else, mm -hmm. may, I don't know if it affects the scent. So right before you came over, we, we actually had a bear come up to our camp site. Um, now this is, this is debatable. But are you, this is what a bear sounds like in the woods. <laughs> well, we're just like, <laughs> and then you never hear anything else. Yeah, so do mice at night too. So we were screaming, <laughs> right, well, right, yeah, red squirrels. So we yeah. were yelling because when you heard us having a big, like screaming and yelling over there, that was us trying to kind of make noise to get this bear on its way. And then when we heard what was your seat break, we thought the bear wasn't scared of us. And that was the bear <laughs> coming back. So I just wanted to take a second to talk about a sponsor for this podcast episode. This is Gentle Bands and Gentle Bands makes rugged, outdoorsy feeling wedding bands. If you remember a few years back when I was doing a trip on the North French River and battling crazy thickets and I actually lost my wedding band in the river because it got pulled off by a stick. Oh, I lost my wedding ring, damn it. So it's a really cool brand, really kind of reimagining the way that men's wedding bands go for sure. Certificate of craftsmanship, yeah, that's cool. Now let's take a look at this ring. That is pretty cool. This ring is called the White Forest. It's made out of tungsten and wood. You can see the wood grains on the inside, which is really cool. So tungsten is just about being dense and sturdy I just love the trees. It kind of speaks to me because it reminds me of some of the northern black spruce country that I travel through on some of my expeditions. So if you want to check it out yourself, their package is super cool and they offer free engraving services at the moment. There is actually a 25% off discount code. You can head over to gentlebands.com. There'll be a link in my bio and use Jim Baird, one word. I'll wear one of these any day because this is, I feel like, made just for me. Pretty cool. How did you, you know, you're talking about learning about how to to creep up like that on people and not spook their dog. Where did you learn that from? Well, stealth has always been important for still hunting for mm -hmm. our indigenous populations, and it still is. And uh, um, I was lucky as a young kid, north of Peterborough, we had a, a cottage there and, and there was a lot of uh, crown land in behind. And my father was making survival movies for the Department of Lands and Forest back then. And uh, he had one elder woodsman um, on the set um, to, he was being filmed for all, all of that bushcraft, that, that great stuff that, that is just coming into, you know, in, into practice uh, <laughs> over the last few years. And, you know, he, he took uh, my brother and I out in the bush uh, between uh, filming and, um, you know, making campfires, how to build a fire, how to boil water in a birch bark bowl. Uh, a lot of it was orienteering. A lot of it was, uh, you know, stealth walking and uh, walking on a, tr on a trail when there wasn't a trail, you know, and, and looking at signs, always looking at signs and always looking behind you where you've been so you know how to go, go back to where you started. So, part, uh, you know, a lot of that was stealth, and that's something that, that I was taught at a very early age, and I just practiced that. And I thought that this is great. I can sneak up on just about anything. Um, and the same with canoeing, stealth canoeing. Uh, I've had the opportunity to 
you know, paddle within within meters of moose and other game animals, other uh, bird species, just by practicing what I learned as a young kid from this native person. And uh, that inspired me. That inspired me so much that, and there wasn't a lot of language between us. It was mostly um, impressions, uh, facial, um, you know, expressions, and uh, and gestures. And it was all to me as a, as a young kid. It was all magic. And I, I, you know, I want to be like him when I, when, you know, when I get older. And the odd thing is, is when I, I got a call from my indigenous friend Alex Mathias, and, and I think you know Alex. You mm-hmm. did some filming with that with Alex. Mm-hmm. Well, before I really got to know him, he called me up and he said, "Happy, <clears throat> we we've got to talk." He says, um, "When I went down and I met him, he said, well, he had told me previously that he'd had several dreams about me." Mm-hmm. And I said, well, okay, <laughs> this is interesting mm-hmm. when an indigenous, mm-hmm. you know, calls a white guy and says he's been dreaming about him. And, I, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I took this seriously. And he said, look, Hap, it's unfortunate that you were, you know, you were born a white guy this time around. But, mm-hmm. you know, in a past life, you were my warrior brother. Mm-hmm. And your name is Mahingan Weebada, which means mm-hmm. wolf tooth. And I thought, mm-hmm. man, that's, that's, you know, almost some, in, in some ways it makes uh um, this kind of mystical sense that when I was a young young kid, you know, mm-hmm. learning all these skills, you know, from a, a, an Anishinaabe uh, elder, and then you know, decades later, being told that I was born a Native person mm-hmm. um, in a previous life, that was mm-hmm. pretty important. It was pretty mm-hmm. uh, eye opening to me. And, and since in between that time, I had spent a lot of time even studying uh, the Ojibwe language. Mm-hmm. Um, and learning skills, axe throwing, knife throwing, mm-hmm. all of those camp craft things that are just, you know, becoming uh, popular now. Um, mm-hmm. I learned those when I was a preteen, you know, mm-hmm. and running pretty wild, you know, on a, in a homemade uh, loincloth, you know, carving my own bow mm-hmm. and, you know, and, and shooting wild game. And mm-hmm. uh, um, probably because I had dysfunctional parents, that mm-hmm. sent me out in the bush a lot more than... Mm-hmm. <laughs> How old were you at this time when you were making these first bows and when you were just... Really- Probably around... Um, we moved north from Toronto, Willowdale. And funny yeah. is I was almost shot when I was 10 months old in wow. Willowdale. Some young 16-year-old was shooting crows mm-hmm. three blocks away in Willowdale when you could do that kind of thing. Mm. The bullet just missed my tram out on the back porch and went through the, the kitchen door and just missed my parents. Mm-hmm. Um <clears throat> Two or three years ago, we had a client, a guest up at our cabin who read the story. That story and the, and the person's name was in because I had that old newspaper clipping from the telegram from the, uh, and the Toronto Star printed that in the papers about young David Wilson almost being shot in his, in his pram out the back, the back door in Willowdale. <laughs> and they named this yeah. fellow and, like- and this fellow... Um, and this woman who was a guest at our cabin says, well, I read the book, The Cabin, that, and that was in the cabin. Mm-hmm. And plus, plus the fellow's name. Well, that, that guy you mentioned in the book was my uncle, she said. No He's kidding. like 86 years old now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I said, well, i got to track him down because he almost killed me <laughs> when I was 10 months old. Wow. But anyway, I, I was fortunate because I, I, uh, I was learning all, a lot of skills. I had already learned a lot of skills. Um, you know, I had, you know, dabbled in canoeing. I, I had a, this great fear of water. Hmm. When no I was, kidding. When I was young. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't know it, I mean, today. Definitely um, not. Although my... Maybe uh, that's why you're <laughs> such a good at not dumping, though. Uh, it could be. It, it yeah. could be. And I hate getting my feet wet. I'll do anything right. to get my feet wet. I guess I love lining canoes. Mm-hmm. And, uh, um, you know, I... You know, I see, I see traditionally you would jump out of your canoe when you get to, before you get to shore because we used to travel with cedar canvas canoes all the time, right? Mm-hmm. And, and you took care of that because you didn't want to mm-hmm. have to do a, a field repair. So you jump out of your canoe, you get your feet wet. It didn't, didn't matter because, you're, you're, you know, your boots are always continuously mm-hmm. wet anyway. You always had wet feet back mm-hmm. in, in those days. You didn't just sit in your canoe while it's on the rocks and then push off of the rocks like you do with some of the modern or, canoe materials. Or just materials. drive your canoe up bow first, right. you know, and a bow person gets out and then, and then yanks on the bow and it, yeah. and it knocks the, the sternsman out of the canoe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah no, I... Uh, I <clears throat> I would gingerly mm-hmm. pull the canoe up sideways and, mm-hmm. and, and then stretch and then kind of mm-hmm. 
tiptoe out in the rocks as much as I could. I just hated having wet feet. Mm-hmm. I still hate having wet feet. Mm-hmm. Do anything. I, not I, to I wear. Uh, that's why when I'm my spring trips, I'll wear like waders with the with the Gore-Tex socks. They're amazing. And I can just, you know, then I, with my spring trips, if I'm hauling over a beaver dam and the water's cold, I'm just like peachy, nice and nice and toasty, warm, and feet never get wet. Yeah, you know, for years, and I think it may, it may have ended up ruining my feet, is uh, um, decades I wore the L.L. Bean high-top boots, the leather mm. with the 18-inch uh, leather tops and rubber bottoms, and uh, had a chain-link uh, um, sole on it. And I wore those... Um, religiously on mm-hmm. all my trips. You don't wear those anymore. I don't because my I've uh, I've lost a lot of cartilage, not just on my sh- on my knees <laughs> knees mm-hmm. knees and my shoulders. Um, a lot of my joints, my toe, big toes of all that clamoring over portages. Mm-hmm. A lot of the the cart- cartilage really uh, takes a beating on uh, this <laughs> kind of lifestyle. But uh, mm-hmm. my feet have kind of splayed out. They don't really make a. a uh, an LL type boot, mm. bean boot now that mm. fit my feet very well. So I, <clears throat> I have a variety of di- other boots that I wear, mm-hmm. um, just because my the change in in the shape of my feet. Mm-hmm. And do you think that uh, that kind of uh, you know injuries or kind of beaten up body parts, cartilage and stuff? Do you think that is because of the uh, extensive amount of time that you've spent? paddling and portaging canoes through the bush for thousands and thousands of uh, accumulative miles yeah you know i was i i always take it i've always kept um journals on all my trips since mm-hmm. i was at, um, probably 14 15 and and i i tally up like dates time distances all that kind of thing and, and i was just uh, I was talking with my wife andrea a couple days ago and we said you know how many times i've actually paddled the lady mm-hmm. evelyn river like there's a lot of collectors out there. They'll do one river once and then move on. And right. you really don't, you don't really understand or get close to that river, the nuances uh-huh. until you've paddled it right. at night right. <laughs> upstream. <laughs> right. I can imagine. And uh, yeah. so I've, I paddled that river um, over 200 times and wow. that's a 30 kilometer stretch with 12 portages. So if you look at, just look at that mm. one river, and I've done a well over a hundred rivers. Mm. If you look at that one river, um, that's 6,000 kilometers. Just on that one. Just on that. Wow. And if you look at the 12 portages, what's mm-hmm. that, What's that? Uh, you know, <laughs> over time? I'm not going to do the that's, math, but. That's like 1,000 portages. Uh, two, I mean, that's that distance, There's uh, there's got to be, you know, well over 1,000. You know, and that, to me, that's also one of the things that's misleading because some of those portages, it's not the distance that makes them hard. You can have a, a, yeah. a portage that's three kilometers that's on a, a perfectly flat old train trestle or something with no hills, yeah. and you can have one that's, you know, a, a third that that just beats the hell out of you. And some of those ones on the Lady Evelyn, like you're coming down – inclines like this with jagged rocks where if you fell if you yeah. drop your canoe it's going to fly in and potentially break uh it's it's yeah, not they're, it's they're not legendary. a cakewalk there's been bones broken on those those trails mostly below where our lodge is in the south and, the, and north channel um but you know if I, I if i tally up all the, the distances for i know i mm-hmm. i did lady evelyn andrew and i did it 14 mm-hmm. times in one season Wow, and why why so many times in one well, season? Well, we we try to utilize um, as little as possible the float plane for supplies and going mm-hmm. in and out. So we often paddle, park our vehicle up river, um, just mm-hmm. at the boundary of the park, and then paddle down river, just to get but to your cabin. Is just to get to just to get to the lodge necessary to to, to use the river that many times. Yeah. So mm-hmm. in in all the expeditions I've done, I've 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 logged well over sixty thousand kilometers now, and you look at. The number of trails would be almost at least 25% of that. And I always attribute, well, 25% of carrying heavy loads over rough portages. Mm-hmm. So that's just the canoeing aspect of what we do. Mm-hmm. So we've got trail, we do sustainable trail building, which is all hand built stuff. So mm-hmm. that's carrying heavy, heavy timbers, um, moving materials, uh, all that hand sculpting with hand tools really. <laughs> Does damage to your body mm. after decades of doing it. I've Just the re- the repetitive of the same motion. Yeah, if, you know, and we've put in thousands of meters of of, 
hiking trails. I mean, essentially, you're a professional athlete of 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 a sort, right? So well, you, you look at anybody <laughs> who's played, uh, who's done any physical, which is the, really a lot of the time the natural way of being. Like our ancestors probably would have survived through the, all kinds of injuries that, that that they dealt with throughout time. But yeah. you know, anybody who's doing a physical activity that much is probably going to wind up with a couple uh, couple you know injuries <laughs> over time. Well, hernia. I've you know I've been there appendix. Um, I'm going on my third titanium replaced, you know, replaced joint. Hmm. But it's funny you mentioned mention that. Um, I, have, I have a trainer and a Tarot Fitness out of Huntsville. He's he's trained some some professional athletes and Olympians. Mm-hmm. And and I'm trying to trying to work towards you know getting keeping up my my strength for the next operation, which is a shoulder replacement. So he, and he says, you know what, Hap, you're going on 73. He says, you're my poster boy. Mm-hmm. You know. Right, <laughs> we have a lot of younger guys yeah. in here in, in in worse shape than you are. Makes me feel good, you know. Mm-hmm. I don't purposely go out. I don't do weightlifting. I don't do this. Is it's just the lifestyle that my mm-hmm. wife and I lead. You know, it's it's um, it takes a lot of energy in whatever we whatever we do, whether mm-hmm. we're guiding trips or uh, you know just getting supplies into the cabin. Uh, mm-hmm. And you know those those where the plane lands. We still have to carry over portages to get. Our clients, our guests, and all the materials in and uh, supplies in to to run a lodge for mm-hmm. five months. Mm-hmm. So it's and it wears on. It. I mean, that's mm-hmm. it's it's the mileage. But I have no regrets. I I wouldn't change it for the for, for you know for yeah. the for me. It's uh, yeah. uh, and it becomes at at a you know over fifty. Um, you know, my wife is just uh, uh, getting knee problems and and other problems that I had when I hit fifty, and it's. For me, it's been 20 years of managing chronic pain, mm-hmm. which um, to me, it's it's like old friends, you know, <laughs> except that you can't get rid of them, you know, because they, <laughs> maybe they stay a little bit longer than you really want them to. Mm-hmm. So, but uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, and, and it's amazing what they can do, you know, for joints. I have two mm-hmm. replaced knees and, and I could not walk. Wow. I was disabled for mm-hmm. months before I got my both my knees done mm-hmm. and uh, it was almost 10 years between the two of them uh, having them replaced so they don't wear out exactly mm-hmm. the same mm-hmm. um but I'll, I'll tell you um my wife and do you know we'll still do you know double black diamond skiing or, or mm-hmm. mountain biking you know even with replaced um uh, joints it, mm-hmm. it's, like I say it's amazing what they can do today yeah amazing yes where do you ski um, well, we've skied, uh, well, Whistler, Blackcomb, yeah. uh, Mount Baker, um, uh, um, in, uh, in the townships, mm-hmm. uh, east, uh, northeast states. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, cool. I didn't know you were into that as well. Haven't for a few years. Yeah. Um, pandemic kind of put a, put a uh, halt to a lot of that, that stuff. So we have ski trails at our properties, so we cross-country mm. ski. Yeah, I, uh, I got... I, f- I find cross-country skiing to be very, very challenging, personally. Um, I guess I'm more of like a snowshoe guy. I love getting out in winter and stuff like that. And I remember the first time I, well, when I learned, I learned on the lake, so flat, you know, maybe some snow to break and all that kind of stuff. And then I'm going out with a buddy of mine on this cross-country ski uh, trails around Huntsville, and he's like, well, I'm taking out Jim Baird, you know, he's like this adventure. I got to do something good, right? And I'm like, go easy on me, Nate, you know, and... He's like, okay, we're going to, anyways, just, I just got so hurt. I just was like, I would just stand there and my feet would just be like, fly up from under me. And I just, boom, <laughs> land on my butt. I got a concussion from landing on my ass. And then he got us lost. And then I'm sitting around with this headache, concussed, puttering around the woods in the pitch black while my buddy got us lost. And I'm like, I don't think I like cross country skiing. I just, you know, I think I, I think I'm just never going to learn it. I think that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, Steve, I learned I learned very young at cross country skiing, and and uh, mm-hmm. so we, you know, my wife and I do both. And with our trails at home, we uh, I love, you know, packing mm-hmm. them down with. We have traditional shoes, and I prefer mm-hmm. those to breaking trail, uh, especially in deep snow. I mean, the tech mm-hmm. shoes. I actually tried the field tested uh, the first. Uh, they were. I think the first uh, commercially made tech shoes, which were actually mountaineering for mountain mountaineering they mm. weren't made for like general you know um you know consumer use uh um until Are those the ones with a, met, a metal frame 
They have a they metal were, frame, but but a regular. Yeah, it was a Sherpa, Sherpa brand. I don't think they're okay. they're available anymore. Sherpa, they supplied for that the six months I spent up at the cabin with the two kids mm-hmm. when they were, when they were in diapers. So mm-hmm. yeah, they and they gave us um, snowshoes to test out, mm-hmm. and uh, and I still use them as a, as a reference to, you know what you know people ask well, what snowshoes should I should I buy? And I would say well, uh, it's all about flotation. I mean you can you can. You can buy tech shoes and, and go on on groomed trails without mm-hmm. any trouble. But if you try if you try to break through, or try to pack in deep snow, then you, you'll want traditional shoes because mm-hmm. you'll have uh, twice as much flotation. Mm-hmm. Also, I notice on thin ice, the traditional shoes don't have those spikes. They yeah. don't put so much pressure, and it spreads your weight out a bit more. That you can actually walk over thin ice, as you know in Tomogamy, a lot of the portage trails come in or go out, whichever way you go in at the mouth of some sort of stream or some sort of moving water where the water can be a little bit uh, yeah. uh, thinner too. That's, oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. you got to admit those, those crampons that are on, like I have a pair of uh, MSR, I have both, right? I have, I have three, but I have a, a pair of, um, what are they called? MNR, MSR lightning ascent. Yeah. Man, are they good. You just walk right up an ice, ice hill where you'd be just dickered if you had traditional shoes. You just walk right up, right? Like for that kind of stuff there, you can't beat them, you know? Yeah, well, they were t- they were designed initially for mountaineering, for icy mm. slopes. Oh, these are the Sherpa ones. The yeah. Sherpa ones. Okay, well, they're yeah. the same design as you see today. They're yeah. Just, you know, it's the same like a neoprene decking with uh, anodized aluminum frames and uh, not much has changed. Yeah. And that was... Just around the year 1999, I think, uh, they came out, 1988, 99, when I got those snowshoes to test out. And mm-hmm. uh, I like them for certain things. Great for back, like for ski backpacking, um, mm-hmm. winter camping, because they're, they're compact. You know, if you have to pack a um, uh, campsite down or, or, or just collect firewood and that, they're, mm-hmm. they're nice and light. But Or for snow, you know, if you're in snowmobiling, snowmobilers love them because mm-hmm. they're for safety, you know, they can strap on without sticking out too far right right but it's my funny well, you can you can wear them while snowmobiling well no okay okay um, <laughs> no 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 well while snowmobiling you'll attach them onto your onto the back okay gotcha. your load for safety so they're not yeah just in so, case you need them so you yeah. have okay okay although i've been you know i've had snowshoes on and uh they came in really handy when i spent the winter up at our at our cabin on mm. lady evelyn in april I know the ice was just coming off the river, and I was getting anxious to get the canoe out. So mm-hmm. I remember pushing the canoe. I was wearing my my crampon type snowshoes, um, running with and pushing the canoe across mm-hmm. thin ice very fast because it was breaking underfoot. But uh, and then and then pushing it to to open water, mm-hmm. and uh, and then paddling for twenty feet. And then running it up on the ice, and then mm-hmm. getting out, and then running with my snowshoes again. So, <laughs> Did you it. keep one foot? So you you didn't keep one foot I, in the canoe yeah, and like push. I actually kept. Uh, I would actually paddle. I I would mm-hmm. would straddle the the gunnels of the canoe. I wouldn't get mm-hmm. in the canoe. I would mm-hmm. straddle the back, and then and then uh, it would it was very awkward looking, <laughs> but <it laughs> but got, you did it. It got me to where I was going. Yeah. And yeah. if anybody um, were, I actually filmed that, but I don't know where the film went way back in that. Mm-hmm. That was, that was at uh, at Cabin Falls. Cabin Falls, yeah. And that's where it, and that's where you run your uh, Cabin Falls eco uh, tourism business out of, right? Yeah, for five months. Yeah, yeah we go in in uh, mid May and then we close mm. up after Thanksgiving. Yeah. yeah, what a beautiful spot. I remember uh, you gave us a bit of a tour when you were there and you had just finished doing a lot of work on it. Gorgeous kind of interconnected walkways because it's very rugged, uh, uh, you know, rocks and stuff. And uh, what a spot though that is. And you mentioned magic before, which instantly gave me goosebumps as, as soon as you said that because I remember uh, the way that you described the the trip into those falls where your cabin is it's you know in your book the cabin Mm -hmm. it made me it it made me realize it made me think magic is real somebody asked me about that the other day about when i write i haven't written nearly as much as you but i do write articles and i love it in my my films and so he said what are you trying to do and i said i want people to believe that magic is real Mm-hmm. you know and and uh in 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 a way right in uh on whatever scale and whatever level and um i feel like that is what really resonates for me with what you do and and your 
feelings and connection uh, to places like Tomogamy in this wild country. It, the whole story, the uh, Nastogon, like the trails, the ancient 5,000-year-old trails, is that there there is a magic in it that you want people to discover. You want that magic to kind of overtake them. I don't know if if that if if you could describe it in a similar way or or uh, you know what 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 are your feelings surrounding a place like Cabin Falls, a place like Chamogni, and all the things that excite you and interest you about it and want and make you want to uh, uh, protect it. Well, it's it's an yeah it's an interesting topic because uh, um, I look at today and uh, I mean there's so many changes whether it's gear or even attitudes why we even go mm. out there. Things have changed a lot, and I know uh, for myself, this is something I explain to to my guests and those those who want to not just survive in the wilderness, but want to to enjoy living in the wilderness. I look at that as sort of a transition point that you have to reach and get to, and open your mind. And it's mostly through experience. And the more time, and you know this, Jim, is that the more time you spend out there, the more magic presents itself. Mm -hmm. The more things that you have no explanation for, but mm -hmm. they're real. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's everything from understanding how, especially how the indigenous look at things. I mean, they look at Northern Lights, for example. We look at it, we look at, at almost everything scientifically. And they look at it more in an organic sense, how it connects them to whatever, whether it's inanimate or inanimate. It all has purpose and meaning and connectivity. Well, that's how the Anishinaabe Moan language is is yes, uh, set up, animate and inanimate, right? Yeah, uh, I mean, they're looking at their language. It's a it's that's a whole other story. You could go mm -hmm. into long lengths. Why did they anglicize a lot of the names? You know, across across Canada, especially in Tomogamy. You know, mm -hmm. why did they do that? But that transition from survival to outdoor living depends on your divorcing the notion that you can beat nature mm -hmm. and you you read today you look at some videos mm -hmm. and it's all about well i conquered this river and i beat the weather and all that stuff but you mm -hmm. never you never really conquer it mm -hmm. you maybe you, you'll conquer some of your fears but you'll never you'll never really understand those that um connective tissue mm -hmm. that that presents itself once you open that door and, and then realize that you know, you're there. You're a visitor, really, because most of us don't spend enough time outside the box to be really good at it. So, you know, but there are times the more times you get out of that box and enjoy nature on its mm -hmm. terms, that's where the magic begins, mm -hmm. and and you you get into a comfort zone where you can accommodate all of the things that <clears throat> those basic tenets of survival just become second nature mm -hmm. and then you start concentrating on all those other nuances that make it make magic happen out there mm -hmm. and it and that's that's what happened to me through almost like death experiences mm -hmm. near death experiences uh, i've shared some of those in in my book but uh, <laughs> my wife just she shakes her head because <laughs> she, she's pulled my sorry ass out, you know, out of the water a few times mm -hmm. to, to rescue me. Nothing that can uh, make you feel more alive than almost dying. <laughs> well, I always say, you know, I wake up every day and I, I, I open my eyes and I think, wow, that's a bonus, another bonus day for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I said, I've done some pretty stupid things. I look back at the time when, you know, <clears throat> there was not a lot of even self-help stuff out there. There was some historical books on adventures and like boy scout type stuff and camp, american boys camp. handy book yeah Les, i think lester griswold and there was bradford angier mm -hmm. had a book out and i read all that stuff and it was all pretty um pretty basic scout stuff mm -hmm. um and survival it was all good stuff um mm -hmm. but it there was a lot left out with like you say well, how do I get that magic in my life rather than just surviving with all these, with all these, mm -hmm. you know, basic skills? I always tell people, look, um, living in the outdoors, it's maybe twenty five percent hard skills, and the rest is psychology, mm -hmm. you know, how you deal with. And I think, well, you know that mm -hmm. better, better than most. How do you survive? Uh, especially yeah. the hardest thing for 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 
people to do, especially white Caucasians, European Caucasians yeah. for this country, to sit still for any length of time. Mm-hmm. And you, you can, I'm sure you know all about that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that's one of the hardest things to do. And, mm-hmm. and I mean, you look at you look at our indigenous people the far in the far north, in particular the you know, the Inuit. Um, they'll just sit still and let weather take its course without mm-hmm. moving, you know, because mm-hmm. they know that you know they have it in 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 their makeup that they can't beat what's out there and it's it's just tempting fate and so they sit and they'll wait out a three-day four-day blizzard whereas you know we have a tendency well what time <laughs> when are we leaving what time are we leaving exactly we, 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 well, um, yeah. it's not about time <laughs> that dictates your travel and I, you yeah. know, I remember that was one of the things uh, uh, when we were on the show alone. There was, you know, basically no rules except one rule that if you built a boat, you had to use a satellite texting device to tell them when you were going to go out on 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 this boat. You know, and they'd always want to know what time we were going to go. And it was such a pain in the butt because we were not living on this kind of structure like these producers were. And they were doing it for safety. They wanted to have a boat a couple kilometers away that in case you dumped in this rickety boat that you mm-hmm. built with wire and sticks that they could get you before you before you died, right? Yeah. But uh, I just remember being out there and having this clashing of this, like people that were these producers from LA that were, you know, everything needs to be done in a New York minute. And then just not understanding that difference. Same thing. Again, my experience with Inuit people, um, we were near Pingualuit crater in the interior of the Ungava peninsula. And the weather was like really bad, like, you know, and uh, uh, there are these basically guides there that were bringing a large group of of high school age kids i think they just graduated and all of them got to do this really cool program if you got good marks you got to go all around uh, nunavik and do these neat things so they went under the sea ice to pick mussels which i joined them on and randomly i bumped into them here at pingalo crater and the uh the animator for this group which she's from southern quebec montreal she kept asking what time like when are we what time are we gonna go and they're just looking outside and they she, she you could tell she's almost getting annoyed because uh you know that there wasn't really any kind of direct answers and finally one of them uh, noah who i've stayed in touch with kind of broke it down to her and was like you know it's not about uh what time it's not about uh what your schedule is it's about you know safety and the weather and i think the difference is again psychology is she's getting worried what if we run out of food how are we not going to get home but they're just they just have been in that situation so many times that they're not worried anymore yeah. you know i and i i hear i hear what you're saying too and i can reflect on that a, a bit into just there's so many things that are so much more nuanced than what you can really tell a person through language. And mm-hmm. it's like, if you go back to what you were learning through um, the guy from Curve Lake that had a part in mentoring you, so much of it wasn't necessarily spoken. It was just doing and and, and looking at certain, um, you know, uh, uh, expressions and mm-hmm. stuff like that. And uh, until you're really out there, understanding it for yourself uh you know you don't it's hard to just read it man you can't just youtube it right and and or we'll read a skills article yeah um well like i say things have changed a lot in over the last well 20 years or so uh, we've only had what gps since what mid 1990s yeah and they weren't even very good back they, then. they, they couldn't actually have a map because the military yeah. wouldn't allow i think commercial use to, to come within mm. i think 75 meters or 100 meters or something mm. to a location but going back to uh you know survival programs i, I you remember not that long ago plane crashed in brazil and, and, the, and the young girls and a the baby mm. they made it through the forest through the jungle for 40 plus days wow or something and survived and i thought this is true survival because mm. they I, they should have got the guy the producers of, of alone to 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 pay them mm-hmm. for actually surviving that time using indigenous their own indigenous um, skills mm. and uh, and and lack of connectivity they had absolutely nothing to mm. um, connect them with uh, civilization or they n- never knew whether they were going to get rescued or not. So you mentioned before walking a path when there's no path what mm. would you because it sounds like that's 
uh, almost what these people must have done to know how to walk essentially to help or in a straight line. What did you, can you explain what that means a little bit more? Yeah. Um, well, it's, it's interesting. As a trail, you know, I've been building trails. I've been pathfinding and, and locating old uh, portages. Some of them are, are, are centuries old and still finding the trails and, and building trails. Um, so there are natural routes that you would, that you, that you would take um, knowing the geography, for example, if, mm-hmm. depending on the geography that you're in. Um, I just explained, I know in Lansing, I, I was talking about Manitoba. It's a good example of the geophysical nature of, of a province that has like four different zones for traveling or making a path in. There, you know, there's prairie and, and then there's uh, the boreal, there's, there's uh, uh, Hudson Bay lowland boreal, and then there's the Arctic tundra. <clears throat> and uh, making a, you know, Finding a path, and especially finding a path before we had technology, mm-hmm. is if you sat on a, on a big lake in the far north and you can't see the far, you can't see the shore. I mean, you, you've got the curvature of the earth in coming in play mm-hmm. on a lake that may may only be ten or fifteen kilometers across. So you really, you know, I mean, we still have topographic maps, which haven't some of them haven't been updated, you know, for decades. Mm-hmm. Um, so we really we had a map and a compass. And and just trying to whether it's a water path or whether it's a, with a whether it's a land land pathway. I, I and I you know looking at at Canadian Shield that we're f- most familiar with is the forested regions of Ontario and into into and into into Manitoba and then into Quebec, the rock and pine country and uh, and. Uh, Many places I had to open or <clears throat> create new pathways, and then where, how do you do that? And how do you do that so you, in a sustainable way? And how did the indigenous do that? Where did they where did they how, put pathways? How did they know where yeah. to you know put a, a portage because they don't always go in the most the best way to put it is not obviously the most obvious way for example remember the little culvert you drove over to get here Mm -hmm. so that's poverty bay i always thought why is that not called poverty lake well it's because just the way the land lies there's no main inflow to that at all and so Mm -hmm. when the mag goes up water goes this way through that culvert when it goes down water goes this way through Mm -hmm. the culvert beavers haven't even figured it out yet they're just (laughs) building dams on the wrong side so at the very Mm -hmm. end of poverty bay which is over this way you can actually jump on the traditional portage trail and bypass this falls this rapid the next rapid and put in below the the lower waterfall and canyon Mm -hmm. which without an aerial survey without like how did they figure that out? Yeah. Um, That's sort of what you're kind of explaining in, in, in a way, or are you just kind of more explaining how you can, how you can navigate using just the, the signs uh, around you in the bush? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's even the, uh, the physical nature of the ground itself. I mean, hmm. uh, a lot of the animals use, use, uh, and I've put many trails in on deer hmm. runs, for example. And they tend to, to like the upper ridges, um, just for their own safety. And uh, whereas, whereas moose like the lower areas where the vegetation is good feed for them. So, and 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 the thing is, well, he also has to look at well, what's the high water table? Like, is that going to flood out? Is there an intermittent creek there that might flood in the springtime? You don't want to put a trail along through there. And the indigenous uh, peoples probably did not put a trail there because it probably floods out in the spring. Or the mm. beavers may dam up, right. like you mentioned, and and flood out a portage trail. So they'll mm. usually stick to the high ground or take an, a roundabout route to get to where they're going. It might be a little bit further. Mm-hmm. I, and I could go over a map and I could show you many places, even in Tomogamy, where where that's taken place, and, in, and maybe and in Quebec and in Manitoba. Mm-hmm. And did finding those trails offer you a window into the mindset of the people that made them? Well, it did, and, and been lucky too because sometimes, and I'll <clears throat> we mapped out a trail across northern Manitoba, um, just south of the tree line. That was one of the one of the, the most fabulous trips that I've ever done and mm. uh, very um, and it had only been traveled by the, the Dene people decades ago and, mm. and uh, 
there was only one trapper that had trapped in that area. And I saw signs. I even saw traps that had that were still set, and they were set in the nineteen late nineteen forties. Wow! That's and, wild. and his campsites, everything was so well preserved mm-hmm. um, because of the dry climate, and 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 everything is preserved, you know, really well, especially on top of the eskers, the sand eskers, and uh, the. Uh, is this the Seal River? You're, you're, no, no, this is the Caribou. Okay, That's okay, bit, so way definitely yeah, bit, well beyond the trees. Further north, it's the Newelton Lake area, okay, yeah. and then into the into the tundra. But getting finding the portages that weren't Caribou trails. Some of them, there were traditional trails that were used by um, the Dene, and the Dene were mostly overland travelers. They they crossed the water bodies in these little homemade boats, little banana boats to, to get across, where the, usually where the, the caribou crossed. But I know <clears throat> mapping out this, this route across northern Manitoba um, and then creating some new trails, not a lot because, because the caribou actually um, were the same as, as say, the, the deer down south. They knew exactly where they wanted to walk. A lot, a lot of were, were on top of the eskers. So we had, you know, I'd follow the eskers along the, the top of eskers. <clears throat> and, and then following these, these old, old trails, whether they're made by wildlife or indigenous, um, we'd find tons of, of uh, old grave sites. Um, all the animals walk the eskers, all of them. And it's like a high, a virtual highway. So that finding, and then finding ancient tooling sites, uh, way markers, uh, dolmen stones. What's a dolmen stone? Uh, a dolmen stone is from the Gaelic uh, dialmon, um, which means table rock, and they're found globally. And uh, mm. they're in Tomogamy for sure. They're in Tomogamy, yeah. and I know several of them that are there. Yeah. <laughs> I know that some canoeists have built fires against some of them. Yeah. I actually cracked one of them in half, which was yeah. very sad. You know the one on that small island on Obabaka, on the southern part of the <clears> lake, <throat> right? I don't know. There's one there that I'm looking at this thing. I'm like, this has been here for a long, a long time. time. Yeah. yeah. Well, these were places w- where um, the uh, First Nations would, would put offerings of some kind. Oh, okay. Uh, and I've got photos of some in the far north where... I just thought it was a good table to use, sit, to sit on. Or well, whatever. yeah, some of them, and I don't know if this catches on the, on the, uh, on the camera, but <clears throat> most of these are propped up. The dolmen mm-hmm. stones usually have rocks underneath, mm-hmm. <clears throat> so the the cavity underneath would would present itself as a place to to store offerings. Oh, okay, okay. <clears throat> and you'll see yeah. some of these are massive. I've got shots um, with my camera um, in the far north. Some of these, and you wonder. Well, <clears throat> there was one in particular. It, it was uh, well, it had to be five times the size of this table. Um, it was propped neatly on three rocks, and you wonder. Wow. Well, did, was that just a glacial erratic and that was just dropped there on top right. of these rocks? Or was that somehow maneuvered up and you, th- and you look around the size of the trees mm-hmm. or maybe the size of your arms? And they're, you know, they're, they're, these are old, old spruce trees mm-hmm. in that kind of scabrous tree line area of northern Canada. Almost sounds like something Moet would explain and like the Albin people. I don't know if you've ever read the Far Fars. It almost seemed like something like uh, like a Norse thing or some of those huge rocks. Well, how did they? Size. You know, yeah. And how did they? If they used like timbers, how mm-hmm. did they? How did they lever that rock up to sit on top of of the small rocks mm-hmm. in such a way, or even the the table rocks that I've seen propped up, I've and and found offerings old old um, mm-hmm. like spear and, and arrowhead points and mm-hmm. and underneath there just and that uh, yeah. So th- these are the things. I know that I have found <clears throat> on my travels getting off or or, mm-hmm. or recreating an, an old trail or 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 making a new trail. Um, and uh, what's that feeling like to find something? Well, like see, that? this is part of the magic. And, yes, yeah. you know, you see these things, and and you open your eyes and you think, well, first of all, you don't know how old it is, so you don't know, mm-hmm. um, you don't know, and there's no. No, certainly no garbage. Mm-hmm. The, the only garbage that I found on an asker was the burial site of one of the chiefs from the Den, the Dene, a Dene chief from the 1940s. He was buried on the top of an asker, standing up because he wanted to be able to watch his his ancestors or, uh, wow. paddle by. <clears throat> and I found that asker only by accident because we pulled in, and uh, very calm day. Um, 
And we were just exploring the Esker and came across a belt knife, a leather belt knife with a, with a sheath knife, um, just laid on the top of the Esker. Mm-hmm. And it, that's testament to how nature preserves it you know these type of things in the north mm-hmm. um that was his apparently that was his sheath mm-hmm. knife that was that was placed on top of his burial site wow and it was you know it, it was it was a bit of trepidation for the four of us that were 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 there <clears throat> because we, we felt that we were invading that private space right. yeah. and so I, now we can't we can't stay here we mm-hmm. we've got to go and, and and at that moment a strong wind came up mm. and uh, and it was just like telling us that no this is a private yeah. space this yeah. is this is for an indigenous people yeah. only mm-hmm. and mm. so we got off there and, and we paddled mm. on but that that's the kind of magic mm. and I've had many many cases like that mm. over the and years. and you say well is it just coincidence or is it not or it, is to it, me it's not coincidence yeah. and, mm-hmm. I, and I and because of the num- number of times mm. that uh, that this has happened to me. I get and I get and on the Thelon, for example, on uh, at uh, and I wrote a book uh, based on the John Hornby expedition. I don't know. Mm-hmm. If you, you've read I'm that. familiar with the John Hornby uh, expedition. Which book of yours? That's was that? Dance of the Dead Men. And I okay, actually, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm familiar and, with it. But. And I worked a long time on that book, doing mm-hmm. the research on that, and and trying to to cover that story in, in a different manner. Mm-hmm. Actually, putting dialogue to the three men. Mm-hmm. Um, based on that story, and so far, it's, I've had a lot of good reviews on that. And but going back to the the magic of it all, is I've been on mm-hmm. on the Thelon a few times, mm-hmm. and the first time I was on there, we were, we were shooting a story for City TV in Toronto. I was, I was with Bob Hunter, co-founder of Greenpeace, and we were mm-hmm. doing a story on the Thelon, basically because they were they wanted to uh, declassify the Thelon Game Sanctuary because of because of, of mining, because of diamond interests. Mm-hmm. So we were doing a story on the Thelon. And, of course, you, you have to stop at, at, the, at the Hornby um, cabin site and graveyard. Mm-hmm. So the graveyard's still there. And I remember being filmed, and I said, well, I'm going to have a, I'm gonna have a sit down and have a smoke with John Hornby and the mm-hmm. boys, the lads. Mm-hmm. And I sat between the, the, the grave markers. I had my pipe out, and it was a calm day, and we're... You know we're we're grouped around and and they're doing some filming, and I when I as soon as I lit my pipe and that first waft of smoke came out of that pipe, mm-hmm. a wind came, a, such a strong blast of wind came and it knocked everybody's hat off. Wow! <laughs> and wow! And everybody just everybody just stopped and said, yeah. "Okay, that's not a coincidence. Mm-hmm. That is just too that's just too strange." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I I, I yeah. when I was on one of my long solo trips, I love those moments where you kind of just connect. Where you're almost in in a, a state where you're almost daydreaming. We'll call mm-hmm. it. And uh, it, what said to me is, you know, like you're explaining about uh, science that a lot of people have a more scientific way to explain something. Uh, you know, science is always in a way, eventually going to be able to explain magic, but who's the magician? You know what I mean? Even, even yeah. every, every magic trick that's out there, you can explain how the magic trick is done and has taken place, which yeah. is science, but there's still the magician behind it doing it. Yeah, yeah. There's that sleight of hand that we, mm. we still can't explain. I, uh, mm. <laughs> I have one story that I, I tell at my, some of my talks and I told this in Lansing because they had lots of questions about, uh, pictographs mm-hmm. and I showed one slide and it was a uh, one of the more powerful um, drawings on the or paintings on the on a rock on the it's on the on the blood vein in <clears throat> actually Woodland Caribou Park and mm-hmm. a lot of these sites I had uh, privy to because I'd been working with um, I wanted to at least s- sketch and know where these sites were they didn't go in my book my guidebook because I'll only put uh, um, pictograph sites in that, are, that have already previously been advertised in other mm. uh, documentations but i had a group with me i remember and i was actually filming a uh, a mink that had a merganser in its mouth and uh, i stopped to film it and i said well <clears throat> if you go over to that rock face i told my group to go over there but be 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 quiet and i'll catch up to you well i spent more time than i should have and the group had was at this rock face and it was a uh, the painting was of a shaman and these are very these are very powerful sites, 
And they were splashing water on it and touching it. And, that, and I, I was just aghast. And I was saying, oh, no, 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 this is not good. Mm -hmm. um, you're not supposed to do this. And I, it was my fault because I usually go in first and I go quiet, put some tobacco down. Mm -hmm. I give everybody tobacco so they can do their own personal offering and then, and then, and then, and then leave. Well, they were doing all kinds of stuff. And I, and I just shook my head, this is not good. Mm -hmm. and, and, a, and a huge storm came up. Uh, within the, the next 15, 20 minutes. I mean, a, one of these microburst storms mm -hmm. out of nowhere. And we paddled like crazy to get to the campsite and pitch and tie everything off. Mm -hmm. And uh, and trees were coming down around us. And I thought, <laughs> okay, that's not a coincidence either. Mm -hmm. But getting back to the, the story about pictographs is that everybody wants to know, well, tell me about the pictographs. You know, it's just like gra Indian graffiti, right? Well, mm -hmm. it's not Indian graffiti, it's mm. indigenous spirit places. Um, I think they call it harmonic conversion points now. Um, kind of a scientific harmonic conversion points. That sounds yeah. awesome. What does that mean? <clears throat> I know, and I'm, I'm not sure how to translate that. But these <laughs> these were actually <laughs> sacred places. You're better off ask you translating a native word, probably. Yeah. Well, <laughs> these were teaching sites, but they were. Mm. And the shaman, they don't. And the word shaman is something that we've kind of labeled. Uh, a, a healer of the upright life mm -hmm. is is more accurate. Mm -hmm. You weren't supposed to go to these sites without permission, mm -hmm. or or unless there was some act of of uh, healing going on. Um, and I I sp spent a winter on the on the shores of Mich of, of Lake Superior writing my Missinabi book, and there's a lot of stories about deaths at some of the spiritual sites along the Missinabi, which I was investigating. And I spent a lot of time at uh, Mitch McCotton Reserve going through all, all of their folklore, legend stories. And I was mm -hmm. I, I actually off the cuff, I, I, I asked one of the, the elders there, it was, okay, we have all these pictographs, these paintings. Um, we can go to the best hardware store and get the best paint, but, we, but it'll last maybe four or five years mm -hmm. on our docks and our, and our houses. Mm -hmm. What's the science behind the bonding agent on these pictographs and he just, just laughed at me and he said, he said it's not science it's magic mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> and i knew a little bit about about the, the legends and the folklore and he explained and i explained this to my to you know my uh, um, my audience and that uh, whether you believe this or not mm -hmm. um it's we we have known components for for what's used like like ochre. O red ochre, which is mined in a Die. couple of different places, mm -hmm. uh, Port de Lanfe on the Matawa, and then, uh, you know, there's a couple of places in, uh, in Killarney. And it was traded amongst some of, some of the, the native groups. But what's the bonding agent? Okay, mm -hmm. that's, <clears throat> that's one component of it. Fish it grease, could be maybe? egg albumin from gall eggs. It could be bear grease it, and it, all sorts of things. But that's still not the bonding agent. Mm -hmm. The bonding agent, I was told, well, <clears throat> the Memagwishawak are stone people and they live within that place of harmonic conversion or that, that magical place where, where it's like an energy place where, <clears throat> um, and, I, and I think it has a lot to do with that healer being able to transport himself. It's like a shaman internet because, because you look at some of the pictographs around the globe, you'll see some similarities like the Lascaux yes. caves in France, for example. And, and and the uh, symbols on the rocks on the blood vein uh, of bison images are, are almost identical, and some of the other imagery is is, is identical. Mm -hmm. um, shaman internet, but you've got this. So you the, think that's a sixth sense essentially? That's a theory that there's a sixth sense between them that is kind of connecting them. If if on maybe a subconscious level or something like that, even that. Yeah, uh, if you look yeah. at like the shaking tent ceremony, which is mm -hmm. you know, and 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 it's almost done in secrecy now, mm -hmm. and that's where where the the healer shaman, if you want to mm -hmm. call them shamans, <clears throat> are able to travel outside of their own physical bodies mm -hmm. and and i mean i could go on and on about that but it's something mm -hmm. that, that we know very little of mm -hmm. or understand the healer would be at the, looking at the face of of this sort of rock wall that he's chosen because of the, the, the energy in that that rock wall and inside the the because the stone people the men of walk were conjured out and they proffered their blood to be mixed with the uh 
the other agents to make this um, pasty paint. And that was, of course, put on the rock using hand fingers, a crushed end of a stick. And then through, through particular ceremony, that was the bonding agent um, that adhered that paint to the rock for thousands of years. No kidding. Whether whether you believe so that is, or not, yeah, I don't disbelieve it because how could you no ever really prove it though? We're like, okay, well, let's try to take these two things and we'll wait and we'll wait five thousand years and see how it turns out. Like we can't. <laughs> how are you gonna? How are you gonna test that out? Right? Like to see if it would work without that. So you know. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't think they've come up with with a yeah. scientific rationale for yeah, you know what the bonding agent is. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are other, I've visited a lot of um, indigenous spiritual sites on my travels and all of them have a story mm -hmm. and that, you know, that, that resident magic to them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I just shake my head and I mean, I've had ghost experiences in the past. Mm -hmm. I know that there, you know, is another dimension there. Mm -hmm. um, I've had personal experiences in, in that sense. I've, I've seen a lot on my winter camping trips and uh, things out of the corner of my eyes, you know, mm. that uh, all these, um, who knows, you know, maybe, maybe Wendigo is actually Sasquatch. I mean, mm -hmm. better ask Les Stroud, maybe he could explain. <laughs> <that>. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever watch his, uh, his Survivor Man Bigfoot? No, I'm not a huge Bigfoot. I'm, I don't follow a lot on social media, mm -hmm. to tell you the truth. Um, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm so busy. Um, either you've, you've writing, done some trips with him doing artwork, too. guiding, yeah. or or running our lodge or building mm -hmm. trails. Mm -hmm. Um, it's it's tough for me to, to get on social. media. I have to put you know go on social media. I do follow some people. I find you know some people you know reasonably interesting, and and it's good that people are getting outside mm -hmm. for the right reasons. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I uh, I don't I don't do a lot of social media and i wonder yeah. what, what did we ever do you know back in the day you know at the campsites you know um we didn't play with our uh, you know all our gadgets and, and things we read louis l'amour uh novels around the campfire and drank mm. drank bitter tea mm. <laughs> you know well i i can't even imagine what it was like i remember even when i was a kid there was no internet like there was no there was pay phones and you, could you, it's such a pain in the butt when you can't get a hold of someone in five seconds nowadays. Like back in the day, that was normal. We weren't all panicking, thinking everyone was in trouble when you had to wait for a payphone. And sometimes the guy on the phone was yakking for an hour and you had to wait out there still with your arms folded, tapping your foot. You know, everybody got by all right. Yeah, I thought, you know, we were running a business, the outfitting company that um, uh, my wife and I ran in Tomogamy, uh, you know, for years. We relied on the phone and the the fact that we had a fax machine was mm -hmm. was about as high tech as you could get back then right and you relied on that for, you know to keep in touch with uh, and contact you know um your guests and but now i mean it's i mean you look at at cabin Fla falls eco logic we by accident i mean we're 50 kilometers from the nearest cell tower mm -hmm. but we're in the rock knob uplands we're in the highest points in ontario where we are and we we have a trail um, I used to use the ridge behind uh, the, the cabin, the original cabin, back in the ranger days in the 70s because our two-way radios wouldn't work unless you climbed a high hill mm -hmm. or climbed a high tree. And uh, so we, we revived that trail, and it's now our what we call the office. It's a half a kilometer, and it's a, <laughs> it's a pretty high climb. And I remember taking some uh, some guests. We had a dozen guests, and... And everybody has their iPhones for taking pictures these days. So everybody's got that in their back pocket. So we're walking up to this high point behind the lodge. And then everybody's phone started pinging, you know. No kidding. I'm getting messages. Well, that yeah. could, can't be. You know, I can drive two, two kilometers from my home in Muskoka and, and I've got no power. Right. Whereas, whereas, you know, we're almost 50 kilometers from the nearest Bell or Rogers Tower on Highway 11 Corridor. Mm. Um, and so that's allowed us to do business on a mm -hmm. daily basis um, and keep in touch with our, our guests and clients. And although we try to get people to disconnect from all of that stuff um, as they, as they connect with nature, reconnect, right. um, everybody, 
ends up walking up that hill to check messages. I do. <laughs> tell you the truth. Oh, I'm, I'm going to put my phone away the first day they arrive. Right. I'm not going to take it, but, you know, after a couple of days, I, mm, I wonder how Junior's doing at school mm. and uh, or at camp and... Uh, you know, or I've got you know I've got an aging grandmother or or her aunt, so they go they go up and they check it and it's and it helps us because of that connection that people seem to really need these days. So, mm. um, but it's nice. I mean, we can put our car keys and our wallets on a shelf for five months up there, mm. uh, pretty much, and uh, you know, and park our car. Nice, nice to park our vehicles because we don't. We, we don't yeah. drive anywhere for right for ha- almost half a year. Everything's canoe canoe power only, I guess. <clears throat> Pretty much, and uh, I do come out on occasion to do some trail building work. And my wife, um, she's there with with we hire students to come in and help uh, mm-hmm. during the summer. And we have a lot of friends uh, that d- d- uh, just look at it as a vacation. Come up and uh, oh yeah. You know, well, they'll help carry spot. supplies in or, or help, you know, yeah. move lumber down river and that kind of thing. That's, That's cool. What do you do with your with your con with your guests, with your clients when they come in to stay in this what is yeah, the spot has got to be one of the most beautiful spots in Ontario easily. Yeah, it's um well even going up river to, to meet either either people will come in on the plane, a float mm. plane. So we paddle up, and we we have to nurse them down two and a half kilometers down river. And mm-hmm. a lot of these people don't have canoe skills, so mm-hmm. you know they'll be my partner in in the bow. We'll run down the rapids. We'll portage. Um, we have canoes salted along the portage, so we don't have to carry portage; it's just gear. Mm-hmm. And they think you know running a class one rapid is 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 like do you know <laughs> doing this this great whitewater trip. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit of adrenaline and mm. they, and then lining up, you know, when they go upstream, they, you know, we teach those skills going up and down. So mm-hmm. that's one thing that we do. It's just getting to the lodge. Mm-hmm. By the time they get there, people are tired because mm-hmm. they've just come from inside the box, mm-hmm. jumped on a float plane or paddled in, even paddled mm-hmm. in and stay over for a couple of days. Mm-hmm. And they get there and, and they, and they look over the falls from the main deck and they, oh, wow, this, this place is magical. And, uh. And so we plan, whoever comes in, everybody gets their own cabin, basically. We can sleep about 14 people there comfortably. Mm-hmm. And people usually come in small groups, so they each get a cabin and they each have a bathhouse. It's probably the fanciest outhouse you'll find in the north. Nice. <laughs> and uh, so we sit down with them and we make a, we, we go through, well, what's your skill levels? What's, what kind of itinerary would you like to build into your, your days here? Mm-hmm. And so we have eight waterfalls. We can go to eight different waterfalls. Um, five on the Lady Evelyn. Uh, no, there's actually seven on the on the Lady Evelyn that mm-hmm. we can go to, and then one, which is which is a small waterfall going up to Dry Lake Ridge. Dry Lake Ridge is one of the highest points in Ontario. It's a great day trip because we go up river and uh, um, stop, look at you know, do some some f- photographs around the little waterfall mm-hmm. that comes through there. Great moose watching uh, trip going in to to do the climb we keep that that mm-hmm. trail maintained it's a, it's one of the best hikes and viewpoints it's a 600 650 vertical foot drop wow and so i don't think i've been to that one i've been up maple mountain before Jeep we can see yeah we can actually see maple mountain to yeah. the north from, yeah. from from that ridge yeah so on yeah. that same trip when we bumped into you the one time we came around and then we worked our way in and did the did the climb there it's a bit of a side adventure you know, to get in there and back onto back to Lady Evelyn Lake, but it's well worth it. Yeah, it's the nice thing about tomogamy is that you can get off the river. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, and I remember back in the in when I was a park ranger and, and working in the, you know mapping out the, the the initial boundaries for the for the park is that we uh, we had to make sure that that the viewscapes were protected as best as we could. It was a hard mm-hmm. fight. Mm-hmm. Because you know, loggers in the industry say, "Well, canoeists never get off the water." Mm-hmm. But in Tomogamy, we've got t- at least twenty different hiking um, trails that go up to high points. So mm-hmm. the last thing you want to see when you get up to t- to a top of a ridge oh. is you know these massive clear cuts. That uh, oh, so yeah. we we did manage to protect quite a few that's areas. Awesome, yeah. Um, for for viewpoint protection, yeah. but Tomogamy, that's the unique unique thing about Tomogamy is these high points. But that's. Dry Lake is one trip yeah. that we do. Every day is a different trip to a waterfall. We do wild swimming as well. We have a 40-foot cliff that uh, you can jump off of. Nice. Or, or shorter ones. That's fun. Yeah, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a dipper. I'll, I'll walk in. I don't I don't like jumping or diving in. But, right, right. Um, people love swimming there. You can swim um, in and around the falls. Um, 
get underneath a couple of the waterfalls. Yeah. Um, and just the nature of photography there. We're in the probably the best places to see ancient pine, ancient red and white pine, mm -hmm. the last um, big stands in, in North mm -hmm. America. So the trails wind through all of this ancient forest, and people are just amazed at, mm -hmm. at the, the size and density of, of, of this forest that's never been this never been cut. Um, and then we take them to a place that has been cut mm -hmm. back in the 40s and 50s. There's an old Camboos camp mm -hmm. um, that we, uh, we have a, a little trail around, and, and it's all semi-preserved by nature. What's left of them, you can see the foundations, and you can mm -hmm. see the stove, some of the, the accoutrement that was there that they used in the, you know, in the old days. And uh, that's kind of cool. Horseshoes that from the then yeah, they, they used to pull uh, all the timber yeah. by by horse. Yeah, and yeah. and so people see that that transition from, mm -hmm. and they know the transition from horse drawn logging mm -hmm. to high impact logging done today, which is mm -hmm. done, which is <laughs> we're still trying to mm -hmm. um, curb that a little bit in the periphery of the of the wilderness oh, quarry. Right? I don't think most people realize that pretty much the entire. Uh, province of Ontario, anywhere where water connected to the Great Lakes has all been logged. So I don't think people really have an understanding of how precious these last few pockets are, you know, because they don't realize that there at one time were these gorgeous, you know, gigantic pines mm -hmm. everywhere, much more common. Yeah, and they say, I, you know, <clears throat> doing my research on the Rivers of the Upper Ottawa book, my guide mm -hmm. book, um, the there's so much timber taken off from Quebec mm -hmm. in Ontario. A lot of that went to the States, the railroad that went straight, you know, straight south across the border. Um, and, you know, up until the early 70s, we used to think that was an inexhaustible supply of timber. Mm -hmm. And then it's, then we started seeing the depletion because that was also the birth of the environment movement. Right. You know, my friend, uh, late friend Bob Hunter, was co-founder of Greenpeace off the West Coast in 72, and in 72, that was Save the Maple Mountain Committee was formed mm -hmm. um, in uh, East Central um, Canada. Mm -hmm. Tomogamy was an international fight mm -hmm. um, that put the, uh, the wilderness area on the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, endangered spaces list. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're trying to get it back on now because of some of the things going on, uh, mm -hmm. trying to create um, or establish that as a UNESCO mm -hmm. heritage site. It's got all the, the right formula for that. Oh, that would be amazing. Just, mm -hmm. I just, it, it's hard sometimes to uh, explain to people why some of these things are so precious. I don't know what it is, but when I look at a white pine, white pines are, are, are unique amongst conifers because of how they grow right mm -hmm. they have that very sculpted look like you've seen group of seven paintings because every year only one branch grows up the top and then it gets pu pushed with the wind that's a way that you can tell direction right they're more natural navigation yep. point southeast <laughs> if your prevailing winds are northwest right exactly yeah but there's just something about those giant towering pines that exist in a place like tomogamy just to look at them mm -hmm. that just uh, just to me seem magical and also just the network of 5,000 year old trips. So like prehistoric mm -hmm. footpaths where people's feet were walking, carrying a canoe over your head to literally put your foot in what might be the exact same spot as someone did that cultural significance. And just, I think it, I don't know what it is, but just the backstory, the, the primordial nature of it all. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is, but there's just something so cool and special that I, I hope more people are able to to and it's not something you could just tell people hey you know the tomorrow is really special these they, you know for most people they don't get it they, yeah. you know to, to they have to be able to kind of drink it in in a way i think well, that's the nice thing about cabin falls ecologs that we do, we do people are dying starving for information on mm -hmm. that kind of thing that that as they're con reconnecting with nature in mm -hmm. multiple ways um they learn about one of Canada's precious wilderness areas. And if you look at wilderness and being in the, in the environment movement since, you know, back as early as the early 1970s, mm -hmm. um, we did a lot of things wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I'm not saying wrong, but we did, we approached environmental protection from a, a philosophical, emotional. Like what I'm talking about, where nobody gives a 
Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, the industry, you know, yeah. they, they know the dollar right. values of, the, of, yeah. of a tree, right? right? So we've had to kind of bastardize yeah. our, our sensitivities towards nature. So, right. so now if you look at wilderness as a commodity, mm -hmm. as any commodity, as it get, becomes scarce, it becomes more valuable. Right. But we haven't quite, quite clicked on to that value. What does mm -hmm. it mean? Because we don't, ex we do, we don't experience it right. the, enough to know its value. If you look at, you know, we always point the finger fingers at other countries about about deforestation, like mm -hmm. the Brazil Brazilian rainforest, for example, and uh, the largest clear some of the largest many of the largest clear cuts are found in northern Ontario in the boreal, mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. sweeping across from Quebec uh, and the Maritimes in all the way through and into into Manitoba. Mm -hmm. If you look at if you Google Google Earth that mm -hmm. and from 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 space photography, you'll mm -hmm. see those huge, huge plots of boreal, but nobody goes there. Nobody flies over it. Nobody drives through it. Mm -hmm. um, and if, even if they paddle some of the rivers, there's a thin veneer of trees where they don't get off the river. Not like Tomogamy, mm -hmm. not like in the, in the hilly country where the where you can actually see the, the clear cuts. Mm -hmm. These are massive amounts of forest mm -hmm. being. And, and think about just uh, you know the boreal forest. It's proven can almost control the weather like it has like a collective consciousness huge carbon sink and huge. also they you know some of these trees will release turpins into the air to mm -hmm. help it rain you know mm -hmm. they'll they'll band together and decide to uh, uh starve out the red squirrels when the red squirrels uh population gets too high and is mm -hmm. eating you know too many of their their seeds right and you got to wonder yeah. is it is is you know does that have to do sure it's hard, it's hard to say well all these forest fires we're having is that deforestation sure there's no trees to burn if it's a clear cut but you know they grow back densely if there's less trees to release uh turpins into the atmosphere to try to uh uh get it to rain this we don't really that's just the tip of the iceberg with this stuff but i just wonder how much of these fires that we're having is is caused by you know forestry practices well i think a lot of it i know the big fire in tomogamy was because of the, the amount of slash that was left on the ground mm -hmm. um now they have prescribed burns and, and you know, and in a lot of cases they get out of control themselves. Right. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, wholly dependent on, on weather and wind, mm -hmm. whether they're successful or not. And, uh, yeah. Um, I think there's a number of factors, uh, well, climate change. And, and I mean, mm -hmm. we've had an, an weather anomalies in the past. Mm -hmm. I've never seen it. I've talked to some, um, guys even older than myself, believe it or not, who <laughs> who, who yeah. cannot remember a winter like we've like right. we're having now. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. The only the one thing you say, like, oh we're we're breaking records from the nineteen thirties. So in the nineteen thirties there was some winter that was pretty warm, which you know, some people might use that the wrong way and say like that means climate change is completely false or whatever. But it it does you you know obviously you know human caused climate change is making a difference but if there's any hope that i hang on to it's that this is also just a really weird el nino year it's happened in the past and maybe we're still going to get a good winter again because i'm going to have to find a new culture app i like to get out there ice fishing winter camping all of the things yeah. man like this year was so weird it was so warm there was no ice the ice was dangerous people were falling through the ice all over the place and yeah. uh, i i just feel like i feel like it was a prolonged shoulder season where you don't have any of these activities that i've grown up doing i could barely even take my kid he's two out two and a half i want to teach him how to skate mm -hmm. and i keep bringing him keep going to pick him up and bringing his skates and getting to the rink and it's like melted and closed and just bizarre yeah no i've only skied once this year and it's, it's yeah been, it's been sad um, yeah it's like no it's, snow you know yeah but i have to admit i've been enjoying the warm weather well so. i at the same time i when there was enough ice i went winter camping with my kids it was like minus three zero degrees yeah. Like, I'm not even wearing gloves the whole time. I'm like, okay, well, maybe that's not so bad in some ways. Yeah, but. I think, think of all the hot tenders out there. And I remember yeah. the, you know, I did some teaching for uh, for uh, um, Outward Bound uh, Winter Survival Courses, and, mm. and I just remember some of the bitter, bitter cold mm. and uh, working with uh, David Suzuki's Nature of Things on the coldest week of the winter. Wow. Back in uh, 1985, I think it was. And and the uh, cinematographer, you know, having to sleep with the canisters of film and batteries in a sleeping bag to, to yeah. keep things warm. <laughs> Minus forty at night, 
Um, I think the lowest temperature this winter has only been like minus 16. Uh, if we ha- we had for sure minus 20 here. But you you're know. for you're you're about ten kilometers yeah. further north than I am. But that's the first year we haven't. Yeah, that's the first year we haven't had, you know, minus thirty at least for yeah. one day. You know, um, or day, day, several yeah. days. Yeah, yeah. Usually a week or two, it hovers around the you know minus twenty five, minus thirty, depending. Yeah, you know, that's wild. Well, I remember helicoptering into my um, my cabin up in up in the falls, cabin falls. Yeah. Uh, one year and having to jump out of the helicopter at 30 feet because he didn't he was afraid to go any lower mm-hmm. <laughs> it was weird throwing a bag out and uh, into the water it, you know into the, into the into the it was in the winter okay well okay that's what i thought but then i'm like uh, what are you jumping no, into yeah no and uh and and then i was just going to ski out from there and snowshoe up mm. and uh so after two days, we had a warm spell, and for mm. two weeks, it never got it. It stayed around, around above freezing. Mm. Lost all the snow. It's just oh, like man. what you see out here today. Was that a January thaw? It's you a think? February. Oh, and it, which is unheard of. Fe- February thaw. I had to wait mm. until everything froze up again to be mm. able to walk the eighty. I think it was eighty, ninety kilometers to get out. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean that's an anomaly, and that yeah, you know, but. But I mean, we're seeing trends now that are there's so many changes in. But even as a guide, I have trouble, uh, you know, predicting. I could I could mm-hmm. t- tell my my guests, my clients, on a tri- wilderness trip, you know, what the weather's going to be like for two or three days because of weather patterns and and wind, breeze, everything. And now, you know, it it, it you turn your head and it changes. And Mm -hmm. it's harder to predict because things change so quickly now. I've been noticing we've been having these crazy fluctuations. Some people, I've mentioned to a couple people, they're like, what, really? But I I think it's like been obvious for almost two years with a bit of a gap in between. But it'll be like minus 20, then two days later, plus 8, then Mm -hmm. minus 16, then, then warm and overall just way warmer in general. Yeah. You know, yeah, super yeah. weird, man. We didn't even know what to do with the maple syrup this year because usually it's like a late winter, early spring thing. And, and this think, year, yeah, what does that do mm. with, um, you know, the normal um, spring vegetation, for example, mm. the insects, all of these things that kind of mm. wait until the, you know, when are the, are the peepers going to start peeping? You know, they're in, getting in, a bad <laughs> sleep. It's like when someone keeps waking you up and you have to keep falling back to sleep, maybe. Yeah. So yeah. and bears, um, our bears going to come out early. They're going to be popping their heads out, thinking, you know, probably and as soon yeah. as that water starts dripping on their head down in the, those, you know, the cavities. Yeah, they're going to start crawling out. I don't know what the heck. And then we get, like you say, we're probably going to get a blast of winter yet. Yeah. And then what are they? What it be, yeah. like we could see large die-offs with certain species, certain plants. Hard to say. Yeah. yeah. What how that's going to affect? Uh, you know. Also, the blue green yeah. algae could be an issue with no real snow runoff and stagnant, more stagnant water. Yeah. You know, yeah. warmer water and all that too. Yeah. Another thing too that I've never heard of before is zombie fires. Really? I've you never heard, heard of no. That's a new terminology, but yeah. these are the fires, especially in BC. Uh-huh. These are the fires that burn um, underground ah. in in you know mul- in the mulch mm-hmm. and and the peat. Um, these all these big dead trees, of course, is, it's it's excellent burning peat. It just slowly so smolders. So it's it's smoldering, smoldering. Mm-hmm. And right now they're, they're, they're seeing all of these little s- s- smoke chimneys coming out mm. from last year's fires. And mm. it, won't take, it be, won't take anything to, to, to get these So the winter's flare. not killing, the, and these no. zombie fires are slowly smoldering all winter. Smoldering, that's yeah. crazy. That's yeah. scary. So, and that's, yeah, I don't think it's, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a terrible yeah. um, fire season again this year. I you think. think so? I think so. I have oh, that feeling. No. That Just because of the lack of snowfall across the country? Lack of snowfall. As we get a lot of spring rain, mm-hmm. um, that and... And, and the amount of logging that's going on as well, mm-hmm. um, and that's of course the, the the water isn't retained. I've, I've noticed that in some of the wood river flows, mm-hmm. there's a lot of the upper sections of the rivers, heavy logging, especially outside the parks, just to the periphery of some of these parks mm-hmm. and some of the headwaters areas. Um, there's no water retention, so mm-hmm. whatever water or snow there is, it flushes through really fast. Right. So and the, the water, rivers the rush. rivers dry. Yeah. Um, yeah. It flush out really quickly. Mm-hmm. There are ways that they could try to work to cut like barriers from around towns and stuff like that, that they're going to try to, 
you know, the government's talking about working with logging companies to try to cut in such a way where it, it makes gaps in between fire zones and not fire zones to try to protect communities and people's houses and stuff like that. So there's, you know, yeah. a way they could sort of use logging to effectively try to protect damage to property and stuff like that too is sort of what they're talking about doing. Well, that's, that, they're going to have to do that. I mean, they've already mm -hmm. started that in Muskoka and a lot of places. They've actually enlarged some of the, mm -hmm. the culverts under roads. Mm -hmm. the road systems have been washing up because the culverts are too small to handle all that um, microburst storms that would be getting heavy, mm -hmm. heavy um, torrential downfalls that uh, have been washing out roads. So they've, mm -hmm. they've been slowly replacing the old culverts and putting in mm -hmm. massive culverts now to hold that. And the same with, yeah, as you say, berms around towns to, to, mm -hmm. to curb uh, mm -hmm. wildfires. Crazy, man. Well, the, I, I'm sure you've seen it. Not that, you know, because you've, you know, no offense or anything, but been around a little bit longer than me, you know. <laughs> hey, I'm yeah, just a young I'm, guy. I'm you okay know? with that, Jim. <laughs> but it's... you've probably seen it. Even when I was a kid, we used to go drive on Lake Simcoe between Christmas and New Year's. Now oh, you need yeah. to take a boat out. Hey, in April, know? I took my yeah. Jeep all over to Lake Tomogamy. Yeah. Just bombing around. It was mid-April. Yeah. And yeah. now we're getting, you know, the lake... Lakes are free of ice mid sometimes in mid-April up north. Wow. Um, yeah, that's majorly different. <laughs> well, Hap, if there's... Uh, it's been a great chat, by the way. And uh, yeah, I'm sure we could go on more. But, I, you know, is there... First of all, when you are somebody that's made your life uh, out of, you know, conservation, uh, the outdoors. We, we talked a bit about uh, earth roots, which is an environmental... Uh, what do you call it? Um... Uh, I don't basically it's a group of people that are trying to make a difference when it comes to conservation, uh, your books, your guiding, all these things, you know, at what point did you realize, okay, this is th something that I have to do. This is where my passions lie. I have to try to make a life out of this essentially as a entrepreneur, because that's almost kind of the only way one, can, one of the only ways one can do it. And is there anything that you would, um, uh, share with you know somebody that maybe is looking at following in footsteps similar to the ones you've taken as an artist as a writer as somebody who's managed to spend their entire lives in the outdoors and also made a living from it while at the same time making a difference yeah um it, it's interesting that's a it's, it's a good question because i i get asked that quite a bit i'm i am so fortunate i uh you know i built my own lifestyle basically my wife and i did uh, she was going for her doctorate in ethics. And then uh, she decided that, well, <laughs> she became a trail builder and mm -hmm. a lodge owner and, and, and a, an incredible designer, interior mm -hmm. designer. And she found out that that's where her passion was. But that was her, her, connect, her connectivity to nature as well. So mm -hmm. um, I've been so lucky. I was not corporate material. I knew that from the beginning. Mm -hmm. I, I went into my own business after high school as an illustrator. Mm -hmm. But um, I passed up a, a high-paying job for Simpson Sears in Toronto as a catalog artist, six days a week, office in Toronto. Wow! It was an incredible wage, and yeah. I said, and I, I remember sitting across the desk like you and I, and uh, and he said, "Well, when can you start?" And I said, "What do you mean?" Um, and it was near canoeing season, right? Mm -hmm. He said, "Well, you have to start." In, in May something. I said, well, I can't. I got a canoe trip to go on. Right. <laughs> so, so he sat Wait back in his chair. He said, it's not going to work out. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, it wasn't the money that was mm. important to me. It was being out there. Mm -hmm. And you know, just being satisfied with what I have. Mm -hmm. uh, we, and my I, my wife and I, we and we feel we have a lot. We work hard for what we've got. Um, and we try, we've got a lot out of nature and we try to put as much back into nature as we can, whether it's mm -hmm. in, in the books that, that are right, um, podcasts, people we take up to our lodge, it's a great way to disconnect. And I say to people, before you can reconnect, you got to disconnect. And uh, um, I see there's a lack of mindfulness in today's uh, outdoor trade, not just outdoor trade, but almost everywhere. I think people, because... Whether it's a population thing, whether it's 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 social media has kind of disconnected us from from that social gather that social gathering, face to face conversation. Mm -hmm. Nobody writes letters anymore, kind of thing. Right. Nobody punctuates their emails, mm -hmm. and and we're we live in a, a world of emojis and uh, and mm -hmm. 
and you don't understand uh, half the times when people write to you and you get angry. But don't get angry. I didn't mean that on my email. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> we've got to drift away from all that mm -hmm. stuff that we're connected to. Mm -hmm. um, it's and, a good feeling when you do, isn't it? Oh, it's a great feeling. I, you know, we, uh, um, when we're at our lodge and, and we get people to put their phones up, mm -hmm. um, which is tough to do because mm -hmm. people are, we're so, we're so, um, I guess, entrenched in being able to contact people right away and knowing what's going on around us mm -hmm. immediately. So we, we forget to, to, to just sit back and, and let things take their course mm -hmm. and, and enjoy nature by just observation mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, doing it in a healthy way and, and a mindful way. Um, I see a lot of young people coming out of, out of uh, outdoor ed um, schooling and wanting to get into the guiding business, but there's a lot, there's a lot to learn. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the skills you have to learn, but it, it's, it's knitting personalities together under duress, mm -hmm. which is tough. As you know, sometimes it's hard when you get a group of people, yeah. they don't like the bugs. They don't like the weather. They don't like the hard work, mm -hmm. um, but they're out there, but they don't spend a lot of time out there mm -hmm. to be good at it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a tough, that's what being a guy is, is tough. You have to be a doctor, a raconteur, a chef, a psychotherapist, all these things. Yeah. And, uh, and, but there's the romance. A servient you know? leader. Yeah. As they call um, it. and knit all these people together and, and keep them safe yeah. and happy. And Did it take guts to sit there and be like, I got a canoe trip? Like 9.9 out of 10 people would be like, take the safe pass path to work at this good paying job. You know, even if you probably made more money, which probably in the end, you probably wouldn't have, you know, from my experience, just cause you know, you would be wishing that you were doing what you were doing the whole time. Would you, you know, but it must've taken some balls to go on this, this path of like not knowing how you're going to necessarily, make ends meet or pay for this or that or the other thing, as opposed to this kind of safer passage. Did you, did you take guts at the time when you were yeah. sitting there and you decided I'm going on the canoe trip, not on this dream job where you'd probably be one out of the only freaking artists in the, in the city that actually is making a good amount of money and not, not starving, you know? Yeah. I mean, you know, not everybody can, can, can do the things that my wife and I do. We, we, mm -hmm. we realize that even when we hire um, our students, we, we have to remember they're not going to work as hard as, as we mm. are, but they're going to really enjoy what they do and they're going to learn a lot. Um, that's our personal nature. You know, um, you know, carving your own path has always been important to me mm -hmm. from an early age. Uh, as an artist, I started as an, as an artist in Tripper. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think, uh, and I, you know, and a lot of our guests are retired um, mm -hmm. at this point in their lives, but they, they've gone through um, their lives almost disconnected from nature. Mm -hmm. And they realize that what they may have, what they should have done a lot earlier in their lives, which is possible. It's hard when you're trying to raise a family mm -hmm. and, and trying to pay the bills. It gets harder to get outside to get that time in nature. But this is something that you have to persevere with. You have to make, you almost have to make the time. Right. You know, yeah. shut the shut the TV off and and the, you know and take and, a hit. And you know, like I I I do that. I, I have all kinds of things on the go, and it's tough. Where with my like, you know, what if I make most of my money on YouTube? What if they just pull the plug one day, right? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, but I still have to. Uh, I live in an area where I have access to that. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you got to just kind of shut that as aside and just get out there. And those are just when you come back and you feel so much more fulfilled. Yeah, there's a there's a huge fear in mm -hmm. leaving that comfort zone. Um, you have to admit. I mean, I even 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 Andrew and I, you know, we'll we'll get to that point sometimes, you know, and. and uh, um, and then we have to remind ourselves, well, we've got things to do. We, you know, we, you know, if this is a really, we're in a really nice place right now, especially in the winter time when all our hard physical labor is, is done. And then we have the winter to kind of hibernate. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And we have to really be careful that we could just become couch potatoes and watch Netflix all night, you know, mm. all, the, all, all the time. <laughs> so we, we, have to, we have to persevere. We have to, mm-hmm. we have to manage our time even in our downtime mm-hmm. so we don't get caught up in that, mm-hmm. you know, in that, in that kind of dark area. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, and it's uh, like this, this winter, like say we haven't been out snowshoeing or skiing, mm-hmm. which is tough. Um, but there's other ways of, of getting exercise, walk your dog, you know, mm-hmm. getting out, um, helping, you know, maple, maple sapping, maple syruping. Mm-hmm. A lot of people who live in the city, um, just get out and there's a lot of park systems. You just get out and, and enjoy some of the parks in, in the cities just outside, you know, these, uh, um, urban areas. So, I mean, we're, a, let's face it, Canada is becoming almost entirely an, an urban population. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, and with a lot of new Canadians coming in who, uh, mm-hmm. you know, and we aren't necessarily, um, adept at, at tripping in the outdoors. Mm-hmm. So there's an educational thing, that component there as well mm-hmm. for, um, for the people who are not used to camping and well, being in nature and being away from that comfort zone. Mm-hmm. Those well, things that we, we are so kind of fortunate that we're almost privileged, whether you come from money or not, but you're privileged to have these things mm-hmm. in, uh, to many of us, you know, that live outside of the urban centers in our backyards, yeah. like I do here. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you're from a country where, or just a place in Canada or a place in the States where you don't have that, you can be scared of a bunny rabbit. Like, you know, it's true, like yeah. some, you know, and yeah. so, uh, you know, I'll think, yeah, I think it's important for there to be a, a system and a place for uh, people that aren't engaging outdoors to get into it and, uh, and to at least experience and then hopefully think that, Hey, this is something that is worth protecting. Um, you know, uh, we, I always hear people complaining about you know, the population's too big in that. And there's some truth to that, but I also saw a thing where in India that has a massive population, a bunch of people rallied and they all, uh, many hands make light work is where I'm getting with this. And they got all these thousands of people to replant an entire forest Mm -hmm. that if that was just, if they didn't have that population, it would have taken longer. So in some ways, I think that there's a way that maybe we can use that to our strength. Um, You know, we have, there's more and more people here all the time and we got to, we don't have a choice and either way except to try to do something as best we can with it. You know? Yeah, that's a, that's a double-edged sword there too mm-hmm. because, I mean, I, I can't fathom thousands of people flocking into Algonquin Park, for example. Right. Um, yeah. The environment can only take so, so much traffic. Yeah. So, it's, I mean, it's, yeah. that's one thing is to mm-hmm. manage what we have on a sustainable basis. Mm-hmm. That's, you know, that's, that's a tricky one mm-hmm. when you think about it. It is. It is. Yeah. I don't know. I don't have all the answers, but I think that, uh, you know, people getting outdoors, we all know how good that is just for their own personal mental health. Uh, Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, I know that a lot more people, if they had, if they saw that path, they would like to do something to get into writing, would like to do something, uh, especially a lot of people that follow and watch our, our, our content, read your books would probably think, Hey, it's pretty cool to, uh, find a way to run a lodge and to, uh, be an outfitter to guide and all these kinds of things. So, um, yeah, I hope that I'm sure you have. I hope that I can help inspire some people to do that too. You know, I don't know if that's uh, uh, something that uh, is important to you as well to to try to teach other people to. That's ultimately yeah. important for my wife mm-hmm. Andrea and I, uh, mm-hmm. Cabin Falls or whatever. I think almost whatever we do, um, mm-hmm. and uh, and we get feedback. I mean, the feedback's nice, and it keeps us um, primed to to keep doing what we're doing. And that's like you say, it's. You know, if if you inspire people in the right way, um, that's going to enrich their lives. And I've had several people at shows and write to me that that the experiences they've had with my wife and I um, has changed their lives to nice. the better, mm-hmm. and it's and it's and that's shared with their family. Uh, and it all ha- basically it all has to do with the outdoors, mm-hmm. not not in a hardcore way like you and I mm-hmm. kind of thing. Um, mm-hmm. but in a, in a soft sense. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I think, you know, the majority of people, that's the way they look at nature. You know, they're not going to be jumping their canoes off waterfalls and mm-hmm. <laughs> that kind right. of thing. Right. So, um, and there's a lot available out there. I know there's not enough out there, um, mm-hmm. especially in Ontario. 
that's a whole other issue it's the ontario parks mm-hmm. i'm not even going to get into that um mm-hmm. well, we could do another podcast on that, that one next that time. could be another another <laughs> yeah. podcast yeah the environment movement pretty interesting though in, mm-hmm. in this part of the country uh, a mm-hmm. lot of people don't realize that that it it was kick-started at the same time as the greenpeace but they got all the fanfare right mm-hmm. the greenpeace did but right yeah, and is there anything uh, you'd like to just uh, direct people towards? Um, you mentioned Earth Roots. We touched on that yeah. a little bit. Maybe uh, your website, uh, social media, or anything where people can learn more about some of these conservation efforts and more about uh, your books and all that kind of stuff too. Yeah, for sure. Um, <clears throat> Earth Roots has been a- around for a long time. It's got some great campaigns from from right from the uh, Toronto protecting the Toronto Green Belt to the Eastern Wolf to. Uh, um, working at Grassy Narrows and, and helping the uh, Indigenous up there, to Tomogamy, which is their hallmark um, key campaign. A lot of, a lot of history um, and often doing the dirty work where mm-hmm. a lot of the mainstream environmental organizations won't get their hands dirty with. So mm-hmm. um, earthroots.org, um, go to the website, and, you know, um, there's all kinds of things going on with with that uh, organization and uh, uh, as far as like Cabin Falls Eco Lodge, uh, CabinFalls.ca, uh, everything's on the website there. All the information and uh, we talk to a lot of people, walk them through uh, how to paddle in. We're getting more and more people paddling in and out, uh, which is great because we the, the more we don't have to use the air service, the better. Mm-hmm. Um, my own site HapWilson.com, a lot on that site. Uh, it's my own online store. Um, stories. Um, You're on Instagram too. Yeah. Instagram, Hap Wilson, 1951, Facebook, um, uh, YouTube, Sanctuary. Um, go to Cabin Falls. You'll see our, our little uh, few videos that we have. I like um, the one where you built a catamaran with your canoes and you're just bringing in all this building material. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, we've done that. We've been running uh, catamarans down with, with, three quarters of a ton of lumber on. Meanwhile, there's there's paddlers waiting to run the rapids, not knowing if they can make it down in a single boat. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're winding down through, we know where the channels are. We, yeah. know, we, we know how, we've done this for, <laughs> for decades now. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, Hop, awesome for, uh, great to have you come out, man. Great conversation and uh, thanks a lot. Good having you. Thanks, Jim. No and problem. thanks for the invitation. You're welcome. You're Keep welcome. the fire burning. I will, I will.